This is the ninth video on first order modelling. This particular video is going to look at mixing tanks. Now, mixing tanks are another application which is quite common in the process industry. So, what's happening here? We have fluid flowing in, which has perhaps one concentration of uh, some particular um, product, and fluid flowing out which has a different concentration. And we're, what we're particularly interested in is controlling the concentration of the fluid going out. Now we're going to make some assumptions, like the tank is well mixed, which means it's got an equal concentration throughout. Now obviously this assumption has limitations, um, but without it you won't be able to do any simple modelling. We're also going to assume that there might be some reaction in the tank which either consumes or creates the particular chemicals that we're dealing with. And clearly that will therefore affect the concentration of the output flow. What we want to know then is with all these different things going on, how do we model the concentration of the output flow? Because if we can model its concentration, then we have some hope of controlling it and making sure we get what we want. So a few asides. We're going to need to decide how to balance um, or what balance equation we need in order to do this modeling and we're going to suggest here that you use either kilograms per meter cubed um, concentration in mass or moles per meter cubed which is a like a molar concentration there may be another measure you can use but in terms of the balance equation that we recommend for the mixing tank it's most logical to balance either mass or moles now, the easiest one to use might vary with the problem, so always be flexible. Now, for this particular video, um, and in fact for the following video as well, we're going to assume that the volume in the tank is constant. And that means that the flow into the tank has got to match the flow out of the tank. Now, clearly, if you change this assumption, the modelling required gets a bit more complex and that's beyond this particular set of videos. But you must be aware that what we're doing here does rely on that assumption. Here's a diagram then to give us an idea of what a mixing tank might look like in schematic form. So let's look at all the different variables. First of all, let FO, you'll see that's marked here, this represents the input flow rate of solvent. So, in other words, it could be something uh, with units a bit like meters cubed per second. CAO is going to be the concentration of A, the particular chemical you might be interested in, within the solvent. So you'll notice I've marked that there. So CAO is the concentration of A in the solvent. And I'm not going to define the units for concentration at the moment, but most likely it'll be something like moles per meter cubed. V, marked here, will be the volume of fluid in the tank. So you'll notice here something along those lines. So how much solvent is there stored in the tank? CA will be the concentration in the tank. So in other words, the assumption is that CA is not necessarily the same as CO, and also implicit that CA is the concentration of the output flow. And F1 is the rate at which fluid leaves the tank. And you remember that we have made an assumption that in general FO will be equal to F1. So what do we want to do? What's our goal? We want to find how CA, the output concentration, depends upon the input concentration. And obviously the model may depend upon some other variables uh, such as the volume, which we will unpack as we go. So what assumptions are we going to make? We're going to assume that the tank is well mixed, so it's got a, uh, the same concentration throughout. We're going to assume that the solvent and the chemical A have got the same density, because if they're not, then you will get some nuances which we don't want to deal with. In fact, as long as the concentration of A in the solvent is quite small, uh, that assumption is not particularly important. We're going to assume that the flow in is constant and equal to the flow out. Again, if you change the flow in, you're going to get some other dynamics which we don't want to be dealing with. 
and we're also in the first instance here in this particular video we're going to assume that there's no reaction in the tank involving A so A is neither consumed nor created so what do we need well in fact we've got two different variables in here we've got concentration and volume and you might think well why have we got volume the reason we've got volume is because there's a flow in and there's a flow out now if we assume that the volume is constant, i.e. the flow in equals the flow out, then we get left with only one variable, which is concentration, which would mean we only need one equation in order to solve for the behaviour of this system. So what's the main equation that we're going to need to use? We need a balance equation, and what we're going to do is balance concentration or mass of the chemical A. So what have we got? The accumulation of A in the tank is going to depend upon how much A you put in, how much A you take out, how much A you create in the tank, and how much A you use up. And hopefully that's fairly obvious. So there's our balance equation. Now, for this particular video, uh, not for the one that's following, we're going to assume that generation and expenditure are zero. So there's no reaction, um, and what that means is we can cross that term and we can cross that term. So what we get is the accumulation of A is basically how much you put in minus how much you take out. So what comes in comes from the input flow, and what goes out goes out in the output flow. This summary is perhaps stating the obvious. If the amount of A coming in the input flow exceeds the amount going out, the concentration in the tank will increase. So you get a rate of change of concentration. And that sort of observation is what we're going to use in order to get our model. Now, next thing we need to look at units just to make sure we've got ourselves clear. So are we going to do this accumulation in terms of total mass or in terms of number of moles? And as we said earlier, it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. So let's assume that MA is the mass per mole of pure A. And therefore, the mass of A per meter cubed of solvent will be CA times MA. So if we assume that CA tells us the concentration moles per meter cubed, then the mass per meter cubed is CA times MA. And from that, we can get some simple equations. The mass flow rate in is going to be the flow rate, F0, times the concentration, CAO, times the mass per mole. So the mass flow rate in of A is F0, CA0, MA. The mass flow rate out will similarly be F1, which is the flow rate out, times CA, which is the concentration of the outflow, times MA, which is the mass per unit volume. And finally, how much A is in the tank is going to be the volume of the tank times CA times MA. And what we're going to do is use these three equations in combination with this equation up here, so this equation up here, in order to get our model. Now, just one thing to note before we move forward, the units of these three equations at the bottom are not the same because the total mass in the tank um, is just a mass Whereas the two above are mass flow rates, so they have units per second. So in order to match the units, we need to differentiate this one with respect to time in order to get the units to match. So here we go. So here's our equation. You see, what we've done is we've found the rate of change of mass of C in the tank, so that's V times MA times DCA DT, so that's the rate of change of A in the tank, equals the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out. Now what we can do next is we can say, well, all of these uh, terms have a common factor, this MA. So what I can do is I can cross that, so there we are, I cross it everywhere, and what do you get left with? You get left with V dCA dt equals F0 CA0 minus F1 CA. Next, I can say we did have an observation that we said that the flow in equals the flow out. 
So I'm going to use that observation next because at the moment I've got two terms F0 and an F1 and what I'd like to do is make the two the same. So if I do that you'll find that having done that separation calling F1 equal F0 and then dividing throughout by F0 I get left with this V over F0 dCA dt plus CA equals CA0. Now if I go back a page just in case that was too quick for you if you have a look at this equation here, you notice all I've done is divided here by F0, cross that term, and cross that term. So that's all I actually did. So there we go, V over F0 to CA dt plus CA equals CA0. And that's my model. Now finally, I can put this in time constant form. Um, in fact, it's, it is already in time constant form. Oh, there's an F missing there make sure that's in. So what you can see is I've got t equals v over f0 and k equals 1. Now a remark, because there's no reaction in this tank, the steady state gain has got to be 1, because what we're saying is the concentration in the tank has got to tend to the same concentration of the input flow eventually, because there's no reason for any other outcome to happen. So this is like common sense is intuitive, and that gives you confidence. You say, yep, yeah, I've got the gain that I expected. What about some other observations then? Oh, again, we had RF0 missing there. Let's put it in. So what happens if the volume of the tank increases? And you notice the volume is written here. If the volume of the tank increases, the time constant increases. And again, that's what you expect. If you had a fixed inflow and a very, very big tank, it would take an awful long time for the concentration in the tank to match the inflow. Conversely, if you had a very small tank, then you would do it much quicker. So as the volume increases, the time constant gets bigger. You can make similar observations about the flow rate. If you increase the flow rate, the time constant reduces. So the time constant has exactly the form that you would expect, and this gives you confidence that you've got the right result. A few quick asides about deviation variables. You will find for future problems and many problems in the process industry, it's much easier to analyze behavior if you do it about a given steady state rather than about zero. So we're going to give a simple example here about how you might rework this in order to use deviation variables, which is the deviation about a steady state. So we're going to assume you've got a steady state scenario with a flow F, a volume V, um, the initial condition is going to be the steady state, which is going to equal CA, and we're going to use these terms here, CA, S, to denote this is the steady state I'm talking about. So AS, the steady state output, A0, S, the steady state input. And what we've said is if we're in steady state, then clearly the actual concentration equals the steady state concentration. Next, we're going to define deviation variables as the perturbations about the steady state. So you'll notice perturbation in the concentration CA dash is going to be the actual concentration minus the steady state. So how far are we away from the steady state? And we can do the same with the input flow. CA0 dash is CA0 minus CA0 dash S. How far away are we from the steady state? So that's the definition of a deviation variable. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to substitute this new variable into our original equation. There's our original equation and see what difference it makes. And I'll do that on the next page so it's a bit clearer. So first of all, it's easier to write the deviation variables in this particular form here. You'll see I've said the actual concentration CA is the deviation plus the steady state. So the actual concentration CA0 is the deviation plus the steady state. Now, why is it easier to do it that way? Because you'll see CA is in my model and CA0 is in my model. So what I can do now is I can simply substitute straight into the model. So what do you notice? Wherever I had CA, I write CA prime plus CA comma S. And there it is in two places. And wherever I had CA0, I write CA0 dash plus CA0 
comma s. So now I've rewritten my model in terms of deviation variables. But you're looking at this saying, yeah, OK, but it looks very messy. So what we do now is say, what observations can we use to simplify this? So the first observation is that CAS and CA0S were defined as a steady state. So at steady state, we know by definition that CAS equals CA0S. So what I can do with that observation is I can say those two will cancel. We also know that the definition of steady state is that there's the derivatives are all zero. And therefore, DDT of CAS um, is going to be zero as well. So I can cross that term there. And having done that, you find the model reduces to this. V over F0 dCA dash DT plus CA dash equals CA0 dash. Now you might look at that and say, yeah, but this is the same equation as I had before. And in this particular case, that's not surprising because we've got a linear system so we can use superposition. However, what you need to be aware of, as you will see in the next video, is when we move to scenarios where perhaps the system isn't linear and we're linearizing about an operating point, then this trick of using deviation variables becomes much more important. So you can come back to this page and see operationally how might I do it. So in conclusion, We've derived a model for a simple stirred tank with and without deviation variables. The model is linear and takes a standard first order format. The time constant is linked to the tank volume and the flow rate and the steady state gain is unity as there's no consumption or production.